it's been shown that once using differential privacy for deep learning, uh, one effect is that if we have subgroups that have small populations, they end up losing more utility compared to other um, subgroups that have larger populations. So we know that like differential privacy normally causes a loss in utility. That's, that's what we have to give to get the privacy. But it seems that this effect is more on smaller subgroups than larger ones. Uh, as a paper has put it, the poor get poorer. So that's, that's what we also want to study. But how we differ from the previous work uh, which was a new groups paper, is that they, uh, we, we want to study a new um, set of data sets. And also something else that you want to have a look at, they only looked at uh, imbalances in data and like subgroups that are that have less than 1% in population. Uh, so that's that's like, like really minority of small groups. But we want to see what happens if we have kind of a wider range of imbalance, like a 30% to 70% split, as opposed to like 1% to like 99%. So we want to also have a look at those and see what happens in those cases. And we also want to have a look at kind of wider range of uh, privacy and like uh, privacy budget and epsilon. So they also looked at only like below uh, epsilon of below 10 and above three. So it was kind of like in a in an area that you get good utility, but we want to kind of uh, explore beyond that because we know that like normally you, you might not in many tasks be able to get an epsilon of below 10, which is like a good relatively good privacy without losing a lot of uh, utility. So we want to also like look above that and also like look for lower epsilon and see kind of what happens. Uh, so first let's look at what happens during training. Uh, so for training, you can see that here in the graph, it's a 70-30 split. So it's like, it's a normal imbalance, you know, like many data sets might have a 30% 30, 30 to 70% split. And we have used the Celebrate data set. Our data consists of 70% female images, 30% male images. And the task that we are trying to achieve is a smile detection using a ResNet 18. So uh, since a smile is not really correlated to gender, uh, we've, we've chosen it because if, if we see that like there's a skew, it's, it's probably because of the data set imbalance. It's not because like there's a correlation in reality. And uh, also the data uh, is uh, balanced. It's like a 50-50% uh, is smiling and not smiling for each subgroup. So we, we make sure that like that is okay and you know, we're not looking at the wrong things. And you can see that one interesting thing uh, that was not observed before is that this difference in like this disparity is growing as the model is becoming more accurate. So it's not like there is this high disparity to begin with and then it's just like, you know, it's there or like, it's not even small, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So like maybe if we cut off the training uh, earlier and like get less accuracy, we would see less disparity as well. So this is something that we see, like you can see that for the non-DP model, for the red one, it's like there from almost the very beginning and it's not really changing that much. But for the DP models, for the three levels that we're looking at, it's just getting kind of worse. Uh, also here, we're seeing the test time accuracies. Now what's interesting here is that you can see that like uh, for the non-DP model, the difference in the accuracies for the female, it, this is female minus male accuracy. It's like, um, I don't know, like around maybe 3%, but for uh, even a small level, like with epsilon of 16, we're seeing that it's getting near like 8%. So it's like increasing, even like 16 is not really that much of privacy. So, so we're observing this. So we, we know that like even small imbalances can cause degradations in uh, the in the like difference between accuracies. And another thing that we observe here is that kind of surprisingly, the worst one is the medium epsilon. It's like the medium um, privacy level, not the worst, pri not the like highest privacy, which might be kind of like opposing to what you would expect. But it also kind of makes sense because like if you look here. The, uh, the highest accuracy, the highest privacy one has like really lower accuracy compared to the others. And it's kind of getting close to being random. So it kind of makes sense that it's like just making everything worse. So it's not like really, uh, it doesn't really mean much. So like it makes sense that the medium privacy, which is like your level of privacy, which matters. Okay, I think I'm getting out of time. Anyway, the, uh, the, the highest privacy is not necessarily always the worst in terms of fairness. And here we're also looking at some fairness metrics that kind of match with like the, the results we saw in the accuracy. And our next steps are we're trying to come up with a way to make this, uh, to study also other uh, privacy uh, methods like adversarial privacy or like geo indistinguishability and see how they differ to like kind of this vanilla DPSGD. 
and you're trying to kind of come up with an um, uh, be a mitigation given the insights that we have gained. Sorry, I went a little over time. Yeah. Oh no, I think I think you're actually doing okay. Um, okay. Um, fantastic, and uh, uh, good luck on the workshop submission. Um, anybody have? We have time for one quick question before Fatima goes to her next presentation. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to go ahead. So uh, Fatima, how is it that despite uh, having a lot of privacy, it gives better accuracy? That That's kind of surprising. Um, how is it that the better privacy is, sorry, can you repeat your question? The yeah, so the, the high level of privacy, that one is actually giving you better accuracy than uh, medium level of privacy, right? How is that happening? It's, it's not getting better accuracy, it's getting less disparity in accuracies. So it's like, it's giving around 60%, but it's like for male and female, it's both around 60%. Whereas with the like medium one, you're getting 70 and 80%, high, higher disparity. Yeah, I sorry, I didn't clarify that, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go to the next presentation. Very good. And actually, um, maybe one thing that would be good to do, since it's a, a wider audience today as well, um, is kind of introduce yourself and where you're from a little bit at the at the beginning. Okay. And we, and we don't normally do that because we kind of know each other at this point, but uh, just for the benefit of the folks who are around. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm Fatma. I'm from, I go to UC San Diego. I'm studying, PhD. I'm a PhD student. I'm studying PhD. And <laughs> I'm a CS PhD student. And I'm starting my third year right now. I'm also right now interning with um, MSR AI, and I'm also working on privacy, but privacy for uh, NLP tasks mostly. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start the second project right now. Okay. Uh, so do you guys see my screen? Yes? We do. Yep. Yeah, okay, great. So this other, the second project uh, is on interpretable segmentation. So what do we mean by that? It's that um, in medical imaging and like uh, segmentation is kind of a problem, right? So what we want to do is we want to uh, be able to kind of, uh, we have, our goal is twofold. It's both, we want to be able to see how the segmentation model is actually making its decision. So how it's like deciding which part, we, we're focusing on pancreas segmentation. So which part of the image is like the pancreas? We want to figure that out. And also we want to see that, okay, if it's like making its decision based on only parts of this image and it doesn't need all of the uh, kind of this medical image, we can remove some parts of it. We can like uh, black them out or just like remove them. And we can only use this part that is relevant to our task. So we don't really need to be keeping extra information, which is kind of a privacy leakage. So our, our goal is kind of, we want to get interpretability. And also if we can like based on this interpretation, remove some part of an image so that we can have privacy as well, then like we're, we're really winning. Uh, so uh, here, what you're seeing is that the overall setup that you're using. Uh, so our setup, it's kind of, um, we have two models. One of them we're calling an interpretability model. And the other one is the main model that is like doing the segmentation. So on the right, you're seeing the inter inter interpretability uh, kind of pipeline. And the left one is the actual uh, segmentation uh, pipeline, which is like the utility, we call it the utility model, which is a unit. Uh, so for the interpretability, interpretability model, we have like this small, uh, I think it's linear autoencoder that you're using and uh, we're feeding the image to this and its output is like a map, which is the same size as the image. And we're ca uh, calling it the scales map because uh, it's kind of showing us which part is supposed to be more important. And how we do this, how we like figure out which part is important is that if you're doing this training process, we also have uh, an element wise, uh, we also have like this noise tensor that is sampled from uh, an actual, uh, uh, a normal distribution. You can see it here like it's zero and one. Uh, and we sample from this, we multiply this uh, noise element wise by our scale sensor. And then we get like this tensor that is like supposed to show us which part is more important and which is like less. We, uh, we add this to the input image and then we feed it to the utility model. So the, we have this pipeline. And now what we're trying to train is that we are only trying to train the scale sensor and the interpretability model here. So we're freezing the utility model. We, we assume that there is this segmentation model and we're trying to figure out how it works, right? So that's frozen. And we're only training the interpretability and the scales model. 
So what we're hoping to see is that this noise is kind of like reinforcement learning thing. It's like you're increasing and decreasing the importance of different parts of the image to figure out what parts are important. So this is kind of based on a prior work uh, cloak that like we also worked on. So we're taking the uh, the loss function that we had there and we're kind of using it uh, for a segmentation here with an autoencoder. Uh, the autoencoder is there to help us figure out which parts of the image are important once the image, um, maybe like, maybe the pancreas is not always in the same place. So this model kind of helps us get a sense of what the image looks like. Uh, and then like we are adding the noise. And uh, so one thing we tried is that we tried to like not use the noise and just figure out which pixels or like which features are important and it didn't even work. So we, we ended up like not getting anything. The image would just fade to black. So it's like really important to have this noise element because it kind of gives you this uh, maybe like a flexibility that like you can you can see like what happens when pixels are going up and down. Anyway, we, we train this uh, whole pipeline and uh, after many iterations, we see that, okay, like it's starting to like uh, figure out what is important and like what, uh, if it blacks out what pictures or if it noises out what pixels, then the utility model is not working anymore. So uh, once we have this thing trained, then we can just freeze the interpretability model, we freeze the scales, and from that point on, we just pass any image to the interpretability model, we multiply it by the scales, and then we feed it to the utility model, and then we know that we're getting a good accuracy. Now, how does this like really work with interpretability? We, we have some really cool GIFs here that you can see as you're increasing the noise. So we have this lambda here that is kind of giving us a trade-off between how much noise and like how much occlusion we're getting and how much utility we're receiving. So as we're trying to like give more noise, you can see that more of the surrounding and the red parts are pancreas, more of it is getting uh, kind of removed and we're only remaining with the pancreas. So this shows that what parts are like important relatively. So it's like this, uh, the surrounding parts in both images, you can see like it's the kidneys that matter and they're fading the last. So it's kind of like uh, the, model is basing its decision on the kidneys as well. So yeah, it's kind of like they start fading away based on the importance that they have to the model. And finally, we only have the pancreas. And yeah, here we're just seeing the kind of a trade-off between the percentage of the image that we can remove and the utility that we're getting. And our next steps are like, we think we have relatively good results right now. So we wanna start writing our papers. So we're like trying to sell like, a uh, good venue for it. And we also want to try this on different data sets, like maybe for like lungs, maybe we could do something with COVID data sets. And we're also looking for a good uh, interpretability baseline that we can compare with. So yeah, that's what we're doing, but I, but we are kind of almost done. So yeah, we're, we're starting writing the paper. Thanks everyone. And I think we have time for a question. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> um. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we have time for probably one question on this one, and then we can we can have more questions outside in the gather after after the talks are completed. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Fatima. Um, excellent work, Thanks, and uh, best of luck on your submission. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Sounds good. Um, all right. Very good. Um, so thank you. Uh, Fatima. So next up, if my computer will keep up with me. So uh, next up, we have uh, Kritika, who's going to be talking about automatic sensitivity analysis for differential privacy. Kritika, um, introduce yourself, where you're from, and then uh, uh, jump into your presentation. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Kritika. I'm from Bangalore, India. I am pursuing a master's uh, at IIIT Hyderabad, where I work on reinforcement learning related problems. And uh, I also lead the differential privacy research team at OpenMind. So that's my quick introduction. And now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I hope it's visible. I don't see anything, Kritika. Oh, it's, it's coming. Um, was it? Is it visible now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, automatic sensor privacy of everything that we've discussed so far. Uh, we first looked at what differential privacy really is, but um, everyone seems to know that. Uh, so. 
um, two things when you have to take care of when you have to make uh, something differentially private is uh, the way you do that is based on what budget you have, what privacy budget that you can uh, you, you can use, and the, the sensitivity of the query function that you're dealing with. So uh, that 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 completely determines uh, how much noise you have to add to in order to obtain a certain level of privacy. And the sensitivity of a query, as we had seen earlier as well, is defined by how much the final uh, query result can change, uh, the maximum possible value that it can change. Uh, when you take any two neighboring databases where two neighboring databases just differ on one single user. And uh, so we have to figure out a way to calculate the sensitivity of any, any arbitrary query function. And um, so the key challenge that comes up is that uh, sensitivity of, of any function is difficult to compute automatically. And uh, this restricts differential privacy from being used widely and, and making it more scalable to all sorts of applications. So um, the question is, how do we automate the process of adding noise to any arbitrary query using differential privacy? And um, the, the answer to that is kind of figuring out a way to perform automatic sensitivity analysis of any query. And once we have that, we uh, will be better equipped with how to add noise to uh, to an algorithm or to a query function. And so this, this is a typical pipeline where you have input data, which is private and cannot be revealed to everyone. And uh, you pass that to, through a query function and you finally get a result, which is still private because it's, it's still uh, it's still easy to infer properties about the users or the participants in the data uh, based on this output result. So what you do is you tweak it a bit or you add noise. And finally, you have a no noisy output result, which you can leave, which you can, um, which, which you can publish uh, publicly. And uh, so to be able to implement this pipeline, some of the key challenges are um, to, to, and to make sure that this happens automatically. Uh, the first challenge is uh, defining what a private number is and uh, what its properties are and how it would behave. So uh, what, what's a private scalar? Uh, the, the next part when the query function comes in is how to calculate the sensitivity of the query and uh, how, how to be able to do this automatically. And um, the third part is if, if you have to uh, kind of run a query on some data, then you need to be able to know how to operate on private data. So you know how to possibly add two private numbers, multiply two private numbers, or all sorts of other numerical operations. So we have to kind of build an arithmetic around that. And the next step is, you know, um, when you have to add noise to the data, how do you choose the right noise mechanism from the options that you have, or any other trade-offs that you need to make to finally get a result which is noisy, which, which is privacy preserving, which can be released publicly. And how do you do this with uh, as small epsilon privacy budget as possible. And um, so how do you account and how do you optimize for the privacy budget of any pipeline automatically? So the two questions are, the two key questions are how to get sensitivity of a function automatically and how to calculate the privacy budget automatically. And to, to be able to do this, uh, we've done this step by step where so far in the project, what we have been doing is building a private, we have built uh, the definition of a private scalar um, and how it would operate um, or how it would operate with other private scalars in different sorts of numerical operations which are commonly found. And finally, that kind of simplifies how uh, the sensitivity is calculated because now each value, each private value is bounded uh, with an upper bound and a lower bound. And so it kind of gets way simpler to calculate the sensitivity. And the phase we are right now in the project is we're kind of testing out everything that we have uh, thought of and built the arithmetic. And um, at the same time, we have made progress in formalizing it and making it general enough. And that's where we are in the project. And uh, so the, the things that are uh, yet to be done is uh, kind of building a privacy budget accounting support and as well as figuring out okay what's the best way to add noise to it um, that's my short presentation i hope i didn't go over time 
Very good. You were right at five minutes. Um, I think we'll, we can, uh, like the others, make time for at least one question, if someone would like to ask. Cool. So I'll ask about this one. Um, Kritika, how do you see um, automatic sensitivity being packaged in terms of like how do you think people will use this um, in the uh, in the future, like when the research is done? OK. Um, so I had explained this in previous uh, presentations uh, slightly. And uh, the way I see it is uh, you, you would be able to, uh, one big application area is uh, deep learning. And where so, you know, you have a huge, crazy function approximator, and you want to kind of uh, make this entire thing pipeline. And you also want to do it optimally. You know, you don't want to be over conservative with the amount of noise that you're adding. And so, the the right way to be able to calculate the sensitivity how it's getting updated with every step or every layer of the neural network that's that's where i think it has great advantages okay very cool very nice thank you for your presentation um and, uh, and very proud thank you project, I think. yeah um so up next we have uh rakshit naidu who's going to be talking about computing secure mean in a federated learning setting rakshit are you with us oh there you are you want to share your screen yeah. right, Maybe introduce yourself yeah. uh, and, then, and then share your screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet on mine. Can anyone else see Rakshit's screen? Just popped up. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yep, there it is. OK, uh, so today I'll be talking about SSCAM. That's Smooth Score Cam. And uh, this is a joint work from, uh, I mean, by uh, Hao Fan Wang and uh, two other colleagues of mine. And we just submitted this at ICPR. So <laughs> we are really hoping for it to go forward. Yeah. So the motivation for this was uh, we uh, compare it with SCORECAM. And we see that uh, in the, for some outputs, uh, the SCORECAM output is quite noisy by itself. It, that's probably due to the ReLU nonlinearity. Non so this is what encouraged us to tackle this issue. And uh, these are the uh, equations of SSCAM1 and SSCAM2. So SSCAM1 applies the smoothing operation over, over the activation maps itself, while the second one uh, applies the smoothing operation over the normalized input mask. So as you can see, AK out here is uh, the activation map, and uh, MK is the normalized input mask. It is quite similar to Fatima's research. Uh, basically, uh, what we do is we add noise to the uh, to each of these noi uh, noisy maps that we generate, and then we average them to calculate hey, the weight. Hey, Rakshi, yeah. uh, there was Hello? a slight interruption. I think someone else accidentally shared their screen. Um, can you make sure that yours is still shared? Can everyone still see Rakshi's screen? Okay. Maybe maybe just uh, unshare and reshare it. Okay, just one second. Yeah. Uh, Please, please don't share your screens while you're. Um, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, if you just unshare and reshare, that'd be that'd be good. Yeah, I mean, this should be fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see my screen? I can again. Very good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So where was I? So uh, yeah, I think it was uh, SSCAM one and SSCAM two. So this is quite similar to Fatima's research, where she talked about adding noise to the activation maps. And uh, uh, and then she used it for uh, the pancreatic segmentation. But right here, we use it for, uh, uh, for a new CAM method that we were developing. So the first method uh, adds noise to the activation maps, while the second one adds noise to the normalized input mask. And this is the SSCAM pipeline. So we generate feature maps and then upsample them. And then we multiply them with the input to generate a normalized input mask. And from that, we apply the smoothing operation. And using the average scores that we generate, we perform a linear combination with the upsampled activation maps to generate, a, to generate an output. And as you can see, this is the visual comparison. So. Uh, SSCAM2 performs really good uh, when compared to all the other existing CAM methods. And uh, yeah, these are the insertion deletion curves over the 
uh, over the SS cam to uh, black and tan coon hound image that we generate out here. So you can see a sharp increase and a sharp decrease in the insertion and deletion curve, which suggests that the method is really working well. And then we conduct faithfulness evaluations. That is, uh, we find the AUC scores of the deletion and insertion curves, and we calculate the average drop, average increase in confidence, and we also calculate the win percentage uh, that was depicted in the Biarcam plus plus paper. And then the third one is uh, localization evaluations. We use the energy-based pointing game as given in the SCORECAM paper and uh, human trust evaluations that is uh, also introduced in the GRADCAM plus plus paper. Yeah, that's it. And the upcoming work is something on a uh, privacy preserving face recognition system um, where we introduce some op new optimizations to uh, to make it more efficient in a privacy in MPC settings. Very nice. Um, that's, some, that's some very good results. Can you go back to the slide that you had um, with the uh, the visualizations? And um, and please, uh, if someone else has a question before me, um, jump in. Do we have any questions from the audience? Cool. So the thing I wanted to know is, can you give me a bit of an intuition for um, the different approaches that led to these different results? So do you have any sense of like why um, there are these different kinds of error failure modes with with the different um, the different categories? So uh, I'll just give you a brief explanation of all the other methods that were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, GradCam actually used the gradients uh, from uh, by back using back, back propagation and use that as the weight. So out here in this formula, alpha denotes the weight. So, um, so GradCam uses the, uh, uh, the gradient itself as the weight, while uh, GradCam++ uh, applies a differentiation and does some complex mathematics to uh, get, a get a new result for, uh, and then they replace that new result with the weights. So it's just uh, it's just basically uh, replacing the weights, the weighted term out there. Um, that's what these uh, different methods signify. Like Scorecam just uses the channel-wise increase score of uh, each activation map that's generated, mm -hmm. while we just uh, we just find an average of all the noisy uh, activation maps that we generate. Yeah, and so so why um, and so and then. Contrast the gradient-based method with SSCAM again for me, just so I, I can make sure I fully get what, what, what's happening. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Can, can you compare the gradient-based approach with the approach that you did again? Just like, just describe it again for me, so that I can I can. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the gradient-based uh, approach uh, replaces the alpha term out here with the uh, grade uh, with the gradient of the uh, activation map itself. Hmm. So. Uh, yeah, and that's how they generate that. Uh, uh, that's how they generate the activation map. Cool. cool. Yeah. Awesome, man. Thank you very much. Um, any, any other questions in the audience over here, or I don't know, any people who are shy to ask questions in front of a hundred people? But um, uh, credit, or let's see. Um, let's see. Cool. Very good. Great work, man. Uh, it sounds really good, uh, both to you and, and to the whole team. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for, for sharing today. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Tushar. Tushar is going to be talking about uh, domain selection using similarity representation in transfer federal learning. Um, Tushar, are you with us? Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Share my screen. Oh. Yeah. Please, uh, and don't forget, you know, uh, start by introducing yourself a little bit about, you know, yeah. where you're from and what you're working on, and then uh, and then jump right in. Yep. Uh, so, is my screen? Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, okay. Hello. Uh, oh wait. Uh, is it work? Yes. Hello. Fine. Okay. All right. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Tushar Sembal. Uh, I'm a postdoc in University of Edinburgh, and uh, I'm working with Haufen uh, and Krishna from. Uh, which are, are the two uh, uh, research engineers uh, on, the, on our project called uh, Selective Transfer in Federated Learning. 
so talking about the motivation of this work, so uh, assume that we have a, a pool of already trained source models, and uh, we want to we want to find out the, the most similar source model to a target or a client model in a federated manner. So the reason behind this, uh, why we want to find the most similar source model is so that we can transfer that selected source model uh, to the target model and then continue with the federated training. So we hereby use the concepts of similarity representations, which I will discuss uh, in future slides. And the final aim, like the final automation motivation behind this work is to reach a desired accuracy at a lower number of communication rounds because communication rounds in federated learning uh, matters. And thus, it's thus we, it does, and thus it's called a selective transfer. So there are certain challenges uh, uh, under under the privacy constraints in this kind of scenario. The first thing is that uh, there's a limited access to target and data target data distribution, since because it's a private uh, data set, we don't have we don't know what what kind of distribution the client data has. Uh, and the other issue which come up is that we cannot just do a random transfer of the source model because it could lead to negative transfer. And basically neg negative transfer means there is a decrease in the performance than the original uh, target model, target uh, models. So the two challenges which we have or the two uh, problems we solve is first to find out a suitable source model which selects uh, a, so a, a, a source model. So this is kind of similarity. So we need a similarity matrix which takes inputs as the source models and uh, gives a number, like how much similar the source and the target models are. And the second thing, how to elect them, how to do a federated election or the voting. So first thing first, uh, let's define what is similarity. So let's suppose there are two uh, uh, neural network models, then, and uh, so the top one is the model M1 and the top second one is the target model. And when you pass the same data set, let's say it's a MNIST digit two. So the, the values of the neurons of layer, let's say the the second layer, the hidden layer. When we when we take, when we take the values of uh, or maybe the activations of the of the neurons at the hidden layer, and we pass it to a function, let's say phi, the value given it between zero and one, that's called a similarity. With the one means highest similarity and zero means no similarity. And the thing is, we need to find out this phi, which does not depends upon the target distribution. We don't need to know the target data set. We just need these activation values. So we landed up in finding a similarity matrix which works in our scenario. So we started with uh, something related to a canonical correlation analysis by uh, uh, also called SVCC and PWCC, which will work in NeurIPS, which are presented in NeurIPS in 17 and 18. But when we considered in our case, we found that the accuracy was lowered, as you can see in the table. So we moved on to centered kernel align alignment and why we chose CKA because CKA is not, does not depend upon the number of data sets. While in SVCC and PWCCC, we require more data sets, like more, more than like some 10,000 data sets, which is, not, which is not possible in federated scenario where the client data set, clients may not have that many uh, data samples. And when we did a, a similarity metric to find out the, to compare the accuracy on finding the right source model and found the CK was doing well as expected, as we hypothesized. So the second uh, second uh, challenge is how to elect. Once we uh, we sort out the similarity metric, how to how to elect the right source model. So we propose a, a simple federated voting algorithm where you first start with transferring the source models to the clients chosen in a federated manner. Then each client does a CKA, that is a similarity comparison with the source model and the, its own local model. Uh, sorry, and its and and the global model, and then gives the vote. To the highest, uh, the, to the source model with the highest value, highest CK value, and then the chosen and the, and the source model with the highest number of votes at the end of a round gets elected, and the and we transfer the model parameters to the target target uh, client, and then continue with the federated training. <clears throat> so we uh, we did a we the, our first experiment included a digit recognition uh, uh, scenario where a target client is the USPS dataset, which is basically a similar similar to MNIST dataset, and we had like seven source models: uh, MNIST, the fashion MNIST, the uh, extended MNIST, which contains uh, alphabets also along with digits, then a Street View SVHN dataset, which is a colored uh, digits, then CIFAR10, then uh, Kanji MNIST, and the last one was the STL10, which is another extended version of uh, CIFAR10. So if we if I just ask you like if you uh, if you ask if I just ask you casually like what could be the right source model for this target? 
the first thing which comes to your mind is that it could be mnist or extended mnist because they are more similar but if we go by the results these were the top three chosen by the cka the svhn won in this case then mnist which was as expected and the nstl 10 and if we verify their accuracy by transferring it to the target models we found that there was an increase of 2.6 in the, in the case of svhn so if we just train a uh, target client with the uh, without any transfer uh, transfer we get we get 96% accuracy at 200 com communication rounds but after transferring it the the best selected model svhn we get it at 77 rounds which is right uh, 2.6 uh, times increase in the performance Similarly, for MNIST, it was 90, like 2.2x, and STL term got 1.6x. But the last two, the fashion MNIST and the Kanji MNIST, which was as expected, was very different, different from the USPS, gave a negative transfer. So our hypothesis is that um, using the, a model using CKA and then transferring it to the target uh, led to led, led to an increase in the performance uh, was verified with these experiments. And uh, like, uh, but we had some other uh, uh, questions in our paperwork. Uh, and the thing is that when when to start the voting process, like after how many global or communication rounds we should start the voting, because it may happen that the global model has not learned the, the information yet. Is CK uh, similarity matrix sufficient? That's another weaker question we have. And the next step we are currently working on is the experiments on the text data sets. Uh, thank you. Uh, very nice work. Yeah, That's awesome. awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm getting a bit of uh, feedback, I think, from your microphone specifically. I'm going to clap my hands sometimes it helps. Um, but yeah, uh, is there any questions for Tushar? Awesome. Well, it seems like you got some really good uh, reduction in the number of um, communication rounds necessary for federated learning, which is a, a big deal. Actually, I think there was one question. Uh, it was in the chat. Let me go back and find it. Yeah, I can see one question here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Anupam was asking if phi is something like cosine distance. What, what are you using phi for? Which I think was your distance metric, as I recall. Yeah, that's a distance metric. And it's not so the, the, the cosine distance did not work for us. We compared it with that. For in our case, it's the centered kernel alignment, the CKA, which is which is what we are, which is the five in our case. So I used five just to show a general denotion, but uh, and then we tried uh, a different uh, uh, types of phi, like cosine, uh, 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 earth mover distance, SVCCA, and then CKA, and then if we found that CKA was the best one. Very cool. And that's a, that's a really nice result and super practical and super general purpose. So, um, yeah, yeah. Really, really nice contribution to, to federated learning. Great work, you. Okay, thank you. Um, great. So, uh, next up, we have Georgios, who is going to be talking about two projects one about privacy preserving outcome prediction, um, COVID pneumonia, and one a PISIF high grade deployment on multi institutional medical platform. Um, Georgios. Uh, Please do introduce yourself. I think you're still muted at the moment. Um, and uh, um, yeah, take it away. Oh, thanks. Can everybody see? We can. All right, thank you very much. So yeah, I'm uh, Georgios, as uh, Andrew still likes to, talk, uh, to call me, but please call me George. Um, I'm a uh, postdoc at the Technical University of Munich and at Imperial College London, where I work at the Biomedical Imaging Analysis Group. Um, and I'm presenting this work together with uh, Jonathan, who of uh, Open Mind and Consensus Health fame, and uh, my PhD student did a lot of work on this, Alex, who isn't here tonight. So um, I guess what happened was that we sort of found that we're kind of a healthcare focused group of people interested in, in healthcare, and especially after all these wonderful sort of more methodological talks, people interested, I guess, into the sort of more applied um, areas and seeing how far we can get with the tools that uh, PySafe and, and PyGrid is providing us um, to work with medical imaging and clinical records uh, data from sort of the real world. And we were helped a lot by Theo and uh, Matthias and uh, some other people from the community who I'd like to thank at this point. So the idea is that um, if we look at pneumonia, not just COVID-19, but any kind of pneumonia, uh, we'll find that 
um, it is a, a very uh, sort of very high on the on the mortality list for for children, and especially in countries which don't have access to good healthcare. And um, pneumonia treatment uh, is absolutely dependent on proper diagnosis, and uh, that means in most cases chest X-rays. And since radiologists are extremely expensive and uh, rare, especially in the developing world, it would make sense to offer a solution for, um, for example, machine learning as a service or inference as a service, which is end-to-end -end encrypted or privacy preserving uh, in order to perform these diagnoses remotely. And uh, yeah, as I, uh, as I noted, we tried to actually do this kind of thing uh, completely using the open mind stack um, with uh, federated uh, training and secure inference and also wanted to sort of you know go on a bit of a bug hunt and see what are the the real life difficulties in applying such a thing uh, so we used for training the uh, pediatric pneumonia data set which uh, was in a cell paper a couple of years ago it's quite a big data set uh, i'll show you some examples it's got three classes normal viral and bacterial pneumonia so for everyone uh, you know keeping counts at home viral pneumonia that would be COVID 19 and uh, we're also uh, getting an independent validation set so that's a real life clinical data set from our university and we're having expert readers actually um, read both the the test set these 624 images and the um the uh, external validation set to have sort of a human baseline against which we can test knowing that obviously federated learning and and there's you know in general there's utility uh, trade-offs uh, with privacy preserving and so uh, these are some, exa some examples. Um, you can see they look like your average chest ray, maybe a bit more geometric distortion that's typical for children. Um, and uh, if you compare especially the normal and the viral ones, uh, you'll see that they are actually quite difficult to tell apart. I mean, I'm a radiologist and I have difficulties telling them apart in any case. Um, so um, in trying to do this, we actually found you know a lot of roadblocks. This was a very difficult project in general. We, we're using pre-trained ResNet 18, which is a nice uh, high performance model. Um, but we had to fight the fact that batch norm wasn't working initially, so we had to implement that, patch it in. Uh, we still don't have GPU support, unfortunately, but uh, we're managing sort of. Then we had to contend with um, augmentation issues, um, for example, not being able to distribute the augmentation and having to perform it locally on the nodes or even pre-distribute uh, augmented data sets, thus increasing the data volume by a lot. We had um, uh, quite a vicious fight against the web sockets and the grid nodes um, because of data locality issues and, and sending issues. We ran into sort of you know bugs that we weren't expecting, crashes and hangs that we didn't know how to debug, um, and had to implement sort of a lot of state of the art stuff from scratch. So it would work in our scenario, federated averaging, um, asynchronous training, uh, and uh, and secure aggregation. And we also found out the hard way that you know federated learning is really sensitive to to for example data set distribution on the nodes and the data set statistics which are not known at the start but have to be shared in some way that is also privacy preserving and utilitarian and um, now we're just implementing uh, encrypted inference we couldn't get this uh, working up until the sort of recent versions of PySift with the Crypten uh, API, where it uh, actually started working quite well, and Theo helped a lot, obviously, and I think he showed some results on the birthday party presentation the other day. So um, it works now, and um, it's just extremely slow. We have about 100 seconds for a 224 image, uh, but the uh, results overall, you can see them on the rise, are actually quite comparable uh, to, uh, to the human baseline, um, and uh, we're hoping to um, now uh, write this up and publish it we are aiming to you know sort of get this out because there's few proofs of principle in even real world applications at the moment and um we're also looking for you know if anyone is interested in in privacy preservation with the healthcare focus medical imaging especially uh, differential privacy on images uh, please get in touch with one of us either me jonathan or one of the other guys or on twitter um and uh, yeah thank you very much Oh, very good. And um, congratulations, Georges. I know it sounds like you had some difficult things to push through there, but that's um, one of the first real world deployments of, you know, federated learning. Uh, and probably the only one I know of is federated learning and encrypted inference. Um, so that's, that's a, 
uh, at least in, in you know, a real world medical medical context, which is really, really cool. So congratulations. Um, Thank you very much. Great work. Um, I actually didn't know you had gotten so far. So <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's well amazing. Um, um, man, uh, a lot of things that I, I would ask, but I will probably catch up with Georgia's after to ask my questions. Um, does anyone have uh, uh, anything they'd like to ask Georgia's? All right, very good. Oh, wait, maybe one. Sorry, did I get some audio click on? So Nathan's asking something? Uh, yeah. Maybe you can briefly answer that because the next presentation of mine is not that long. So um, yes, they are actually. So the, um, the confusing classes are still confusing even to the model. And the simple classes for human are also more easy to uh, uh, to distinguish by the model, which I guess is reassuring in a way. Very cool. I would, I would love to chat with you on um, on uh, your experience doing data pre-processing in a federated context as well. I've been working on some uh, CIF 0.3 features um, related to how we can sort of better facilitate that as well. I think that's a sort of underserved problem. So we'll, we'll, we can chat uh, maybe offline on that. Um, sure. Great. Fantastic. Uh, next, next, next uh, project. Okay, so um, I'd uh, just uh, like to give you a brief post-mortem on the DKTK JIP deployment that we did. And uh, for everyone unfamiliar with these abbreviations, uh, I will elaborate in just a moment. So this is a project we did together with the German Cancer Consortium uh, and the German Cancer Research Center. So um, um, that's me and Team JIP, plus uh, Unicia helped us out a lot and other open mind contributors, all of whom I would like to thank. Um, so, what is JIP and what's the German Cancer Consortium? So, this, you know, Germany's uh, um, fortunately uh, able to pour uh, huge amounts of money into cancer research. It is a uh, very much a focus nationwide, and um, for that purpose, the German uh, Cancer Research Center and the and the DKTK, the German Cancer Consortium, were um, were uh, born. And um, from there, this JIP initiative, JIP stands for jo uh, Joint Imaging Platform, um, arose um, in which uh, 11 university hospitals across the nation were provided with harmonized hardware, I mean servers basically, and they were all connected up to central repositories and provided with, um, with uh, centrally developed tools. Um, and uh, so the whole stack consists sort of a, a DICOM server, XNAT, uh, there's a lot of monitoring, Grafana, Prometheus and stuff, uh, and then there's sort of metadata, Elasticsearch and everything. The idea is that uh, people can actually upload the models to the central registry and the local nodes can sort of download them and test them or, or use them for their own, um, for their own uh, development. Uh, and the whole idea is obviously to, to increasingly decentralize data processing in the domain of medical imaging. So um, what we tried to do was to deploy the whole uh, uh, PySift and PyGrid stack, mainly PyGrid to be honest, on uh, all of these servers and see whether it could be used to do privacy preserving um, machine learning within a single organization with this server sort of serving as the, as the a node or as the, as the central, um, uh, central server. And um, the guys from JIP, I mean, I did very little of that, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to take the you know, take the, uh, I achieved nothing in this, it just brought everyone together, but they actually managed to, uh, to do this and deploy it. So um, they have a couple of uh, successful proofs of concept and um, we found, and I found this quite interesting that sort of the, the barrier towards a more widespread deployment, especially a f sort of federated learning scenario which would connect the individual um, uh, sites uh, among them, was sort of more dependent on the, you know, the willingness of the IT and the IPsec teams to open up the firewalls so, the, uh, so that the service could communicate with each other. So um, this is a problem that obviously, you know, I wasn't the first to discover and um, I happen to be part of the London AI Center in which the uh, Mon AI Consortium is very strong in and um, JIP itself is sort of being deprecated in favor of Decipher, which is the open source version of it. And uh, these are both uh, sort of large, larger scale initiatives uh, which aim to combine um, federated learning in the actual sense um, with some of the lessons learned from this. Uh, but all in all, I think this was still a very valuable experience. Uh, and I'd like to once again thank everybody who uh, helped us uh, try this out. 
yeah, so that's all from me. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, wow, really, uh, really impressive work you've been doing, and, and uh, not just on the technical side, but also, as you said, on the uh, uh, getting adoption from real world people to try things out, which is which is really awesome. Um, um, any any quick questions for Georgios? So we're uh, maybe a little bit tight on time, but uh, we we have time for one. If anyone uh, if anyone had one. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's two. One by PyTorch, which is flattering to be asked by PyTorch himself, or them. <laughs> So um, the um, there is actually a lot of willingness uh, to decentralize data processing. I think the uh, maybe in part in thanks to this organization's efforts and the fact that I've been shouting at every single presentation I've been giving over the last year that it's important to stop sharing images centrally and and exchanging anonymized you know uh, data sets. Um, people are getting more aware that decentral processing is the is going to be the you know required and it's going to be the norm uh, soon. And maybe at Allen, um, yes, we did. So this was sort of a closed off project, but since we're part of it, uh, we were you know uh, quite close to the people who who did it. But now the uh, project itself is going open source, so as uh, soon this will be sort of on the repository, and you can just you know um, add your Docker repository and just pull the pull the images from there. Excellent. Very good. Um, well, um, uh, Georgios uh, is on Slack as well, and um, um, we'll, we'll continue for now. But fantastic work, Georgios, and thank you for, for sharing about it today. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, and maybe just like as a, a quick uh, checkpoint in the middle, um, so all the presentations you're hearing today um, are from researchers inside of Open Minds Research Group. Um, if you're interested in applying to join uh, Open Minds Research Group, you can do so at research.openmind.org. Um, and next up, we have Sahid, who's going to be talking about benchmarking differential private residual networks for medical imagery, continuing with our medical theme for the hour. Um, Sahid, are you with us? Yeah. Um, hi, Andrew. Good to see you, man. Um, maybe uh, introduce yourself and share your screen. OK, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sahib. I work as a research scientist at Open Mind, and apart from that, I'm I work as a machine learning research engineer at uh, Ford Research, and I recently graduated from Carnegie Mellon with my master's in analytics and data science. And so that's pretty much it. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, is my screen visible? It is. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about my project where we benchmarked a couple of differential privacy mechanisms for medical imagery. Uh, we'll be particularly talking about uh, local DP and DPHDD on this. So here's the team, uh, me, Harsh, Shashikant, Fatima. Uh, Shashikant did most of the engineering work, and uh, he's been a brilliant contributor. He, he's worked on hard deadlines, so I specifically recommend him. Um, yeah, so the motivation behind this. So we see that hospitals and other medical institutions have like huge amount of medical data. But this data is quite sensitive, and it cannot be readily used because of privacy concerns. So we were seeking to evaluate different DP mechanisms where like, we can ensure some level of privacy. And uh, this way, the hospitals can also share the, the, that data for research purposes while knowing what exactly is the theoretical guarantee in terms of privacy. Uh, so we took a couple of data sets for this experiment. The first was the chest X-ray data set. It consisted of like 5,800 images. They were like chest radiography images, and they, they are generally used by medical people to confirm pneumonia, among other tasks. Uh, in this uh, data set, we, it was particularly related to pneumonia detection. Uh, the second was a diabetic retinopathy data set. And again, it had similar number of images. And uh, these were basically images of an eye. And by looking at that, you could determine how severe that problem is. And it would basically mention the severity on a scale of 0 to 4. Basically, there were five classes. Um, yeah, so um, we started with the local DP approach. So we had an original data set. Like we had like these two original data sets, as earlier mentioned. And we created three more versions of each of these data sets by adding perturbation directly to them. So now these alternate uh, differentially private uh, data sets were created. So we had like uh, eight data sets in total, uh, four for 
each of those data sets I mentioned earlier. So we ensured that um, we were like generating them through Laplacian distribution with uh, mean zero and various uh, levels of perturbations. So for beta, we took um, values one, two, and four. And uh, yeah, then we uh, basically fine tuned them on a resonate team model. Uh, so uh, that was the first approach. And the other approach we took was basically DPSGD. Uh, this is a modification of the general stochastic gradient design and where it basically bounds the sensitivity of each gradient. And another thing worth noting is it uses a moments accounted algorithm, which basically keeps track of the privacy expenditure uh, across every weight update. And then to convert the SGD code to DPSGD, we basically made this main change where we clipped the gradient in the L2 norm. We added the random noise to it and then multiplied it by the learning rate before updating it uh, by the model parameters. And it's worth noting we did this for every example uniquely, not in a batch. And then uh, we added, again, we compared it uh, against three perturbations, beta, one, two, and four, after fine tuning on resonate ED. Um, so these were some of the like experiments we ran. Uh, the architecture was uh, pre-trained ResNet 18, over 50 epochs, batch size of 128. So we analyzed these models and uh, we just saw what were the vari varying scales level. Mm, yeah, this is not. Yeah. So uh, these were some of the results in terms of local DP. So if you see figure two, like um, we had the original image, then as soon as we increased the beta level, the image got more obfuscated, which was kind of expected because like the more the beta, the higher level of privacy we are ensuring. So uh, yeah, the image like uh, tries to hide all the parts in it and specifically all the sensitive regions get shaded. Uh, regarding the model accuracy, we see that like the training accuracy started at 99% for pneumonia and the original task. And then as soon as we increased beta, it just went down. Uh, one interesting insight we found was if you see that uh, the test accuracy was actually like sl slightly higher than the train accuracy. And we, we have we figured out some reasons for this. And uh, it's worth noting that we trained on no local DP on noisy images, but for testing, we actually use the original non-noised non up version of those images. So uh, there were like a couple of main findings. First is like, while local DP theoretically works at images, it doesn't really provide us with a visual privacy. A lot of the images were, uh, like when, when I manually inspected those images, like even after applying local DP, a lot of those images were exactly the same like they were before. So uh, thinking in terms of visual privacy, I, I, I don't think this is a robust mechanism in that way, at least the original DP one, because they, like even after adding noise, we are getting exactly the same image as the original. While this wasn't the case with every image, there were like a substantial number of such cases. Then another reason why uh, we see was that the test accuracy were higher than the training accuracy. So one possible explanation uh, we think is that in local DP, we add noise directly to the training data. So the latent features get harder to learn. And later when we say run that model on test data, which doesn't have any noise, it now becomes relatively easy for the model to figure out those latent features because it has already earlier learned those representations in a much more noisy scenario. And uh, yeah, we presented our work at the health systems workshop at ICML. Uh, I have the uh, paper link and the poster. I'll be sure to share this over chat as well. So in case someone wants to go through it. And yeah, we are thinking of a couple of main future directions. So one, I think it would be quite interesting to see like um, how ro robust these me mechanisms would prove to be in case of membership inference attack. So if someone gets access to the model, yeah, in case of both local um, local DP or DPSGD, I want to try to figure out uh, how hard would actually like how hard would it prove to be to generate those training images again just from the model. So those kinds of attacks are 
that's quite an interesting research direction which i feel hasn't been explored much as of now and then uh, this year at icml there's a new paper called uh, context aware local dp and they propose a new a framework which is kind of like the original local dp but the difference is they actually incorporate the and text in the privacy definition so in the original version of local dp like every every like pixel is kind of treated the same and there is no specific regard for sensitivity because some features are more sensitive towards the model rather than other so th- this paper might provide an interesting res- uh, research direction and it's worth exploring um yeah so that was uh, basically like the main gist and uh, we are continuing to do research in like differential privacy is application in deep learning specifically regarding uh, robustness and interpretability and i'm also planning to start another project to explore private and nlp and emotion analysis so in case someone is interested you can like ping me on twitter or just like shoot me an email yeah thank you very cool Thank you very much, Saeed. Very interesting work. Um, yeah. Any uh, any questions before we continue on? All right. Very good, Saeed. Um, and uh, uh, please do share the a link to the paper um, in the chat yeah, as well. I will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very good. All right. And next up, we are going to kind of switch to more of a uh, a block of presentations that are a bit more along the lines of federal learning. Um, so uh, first up, we have uh, Aditya, who will be talking about privacy preserving recommender systems. Aditya, are you with us? Hey, hey, Andrew. Hey. Uh, Good to see you. Um, you want to um, uh, introduce yourself and then share your screen? Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Aditya. I'm a research scientist at Open, Open Mind, and I also lead a data science team at a gaming platform company in India called Mobile Premier League. Uh, it's interesting that after healthcare, we are moving to uh, this presentation because it's completely, I, I sort of think it's completely opposite to the work done in, in the application domain. Uh, great. Uh, just let me, can you guys see my screen? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so today I will be talking about privacy preserving recommendation systems. Uh, this is our initial work. Um, so as you know, recommendation systems are everywhere. Uh, from every uh, app we use, uh, recommendation systems are powering the search and the and the recommendations which we actually see on the app. So thus, uh, converting this in a federating fashion or distributed fashion is essential for us to move forward and develop better systems. Uh, Traditionally, uh, recommendation systems are uh, are usually solved using matrix factorization, where you try to uh, implement user interest uh, in lower rank- ranking dimensions. So essentially, you try to use techniques like uh, SVD, uh, ALS, to actually break these uh, huge matrices into lower dimensions, and, and you try to uh, you know solve the sparsity in it. Uh, so we uh, we got some. Uh, we actually got a little. Uh, backtracked in our work because we had to uh, get the data loader working in the feder- in the uh, in the library uh, but once we got that working it was smooth sailing after that so so, so a lot of our work is our initial work uh, so we actually exp- experimented uh, implementing f- matrix factorization using neural networks uh, we used the 100k movie lens data set where we have all the ratings uh, uh, given by a user the ratings are essentially from 1 to 5 uh, uh, this work was essentially inspired by the work from uh, from Ahmad Uddin Ketar, uh, a, a researcher at Huawei. Uh, they had implemented matrix factorization using alternated least square in federated fashion. We tried it doing it using neural nets. Uh, the results were pretty similar. We were able to replicate their results using neural nets, which was a great win for us. Uh, we got a RMSE loss of around 1.244 with the, with a number of workers 2,000, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but one of the big drawbacks of matrix factorization is actually it's a linear solver. So what I mean by that is uh, if there is an interest which cannot be captured in the linear domain, it's very hard to actually map it. For example, in this case, if you look at it, uh, you will see that U4 is actually close both to U1 and U3, but it's only one place where it can go in, uh, thus limiting how matrix factorization can help in recommendation tasks. 
so in the past, people have actually tried solving it by introducing nonlinearity into the model. Uh, one of the most uh, recent work uh, was actually called neural collaborative filtering, where if you look at the figure, the left side is essentially the matrix factorization model, where you are trying to uh, you do an element-wise product and you try to solve it. But you also try to add the nonlinearity into it. And uh, this gives uh, the initial results looks promising. We are getting a lower RMSE loss with limited amount of workers. We literally just got this working last hour. So these are literally very new numbers to us. So we'll be analyzing it more. Uh, but yeah, so what's our future work? Uh, so in our future work, uh, we essentially want to uh, port this work and calculate the ranking met met metrics and see how it performs when we increase the number of workers. We also want to extend this work to uh, implicit recommendation tasks, such as number of plays, song recommendations, et cetera. Uh, the third task, which is very uh, interesting, is actually can we move this model uh, into a non-static use case? Because a lot of our recommendation tasks, which we do in our daily life, are non-static. Uh, what I mean by non-static is essentially uh, when your item is just not uh, in a static. For example, your movie list is a static list. You can only recommend out of those X movies. Whereas like something like a news recommender, uh, it keeps on coming in, and you have to recommend on the fly. So we want to extend this work over there. Uh, we also want to experiment a bit around differential privacy because this recommender is still truly not uh, robust enough. So we want to see if we want uh, we can extend this work with differential privacy. Uh, so yeah, uh, we are actively looking to add more people to our group. So please join us. Happy to answer any questions. Very good. Uh, and please do drop that link uh, into the chat for anyone who might be interested. Uh, but easier than in one of the slides. And uh, also, typically, we um, uh, ask everyone to share their slides. Um, normally, we do so, um, I guess, in a, in a private channel. But this time, we'll make all the slides uh, available um, as researchers are, are comfortable comfortable sharing them in Open Mind Slack. Um, uh, do you have any? Does anyone have any questions for Aditya? Also welcome to drop them in the chat as well. Um, very good and uh, uh, um, great work uh, getting results uh, just in the nick of time for our presentations today at EGA. Um, um, it's exciting to see things that are uh, fresh and, and hot off the press. Um, and I think privacy preserving recommendation systems is a pretty hot area right now. So it's good to see, good to see some progress on it. Um, great job. Yeah. Um, yeah, so again, uh, so Aditya um, uh, is interested in, in growing the project. So as I mentioned before, if you're interested in applying to Open Minds research team in general, you can apply at research.openmind.org. Um, but if you'd like to apply directly to Aditya's team, um, you can do so by this form or by messaging Aditya on, uh, on Slack. Um, very good. Uh, up next, we have Ayush, who will be talking about better way of learning computational complexity projects. Uh, Ayush, are you with us today? Yeah. Legacy. Um, can you hear me? Uh, you're a little bit quiet, but we can. Um, okay. Um, I know. <laughs> it's. I guess it's just my microphone is just causing issues. Uh, but no, no, it's, it's good. It's, okay. it's definitely, definitely okay. workable. Um, please do introduce yourself and then share your screen. Yep. Uh, yep. I'm gonna uh, follow the trend and generalize the topic even more, and talk about um, <clears throat> our paper. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, I can't quite yet. Yep, here it is. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Um, so uh, about myself, uh, I recently graduated uh, with a bachelor's in computer science from University of Nebraska um, last year. And while I'm a software engineer right now, I am doing part-time research and uh, machine learning and deep learning and trying to uh, move my career focus more into this field. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about myself. Um, uh, today I'll talk about uh, a paper that I'm working on. Uh, it's called Federated Learning uh, Computational Complexity. Um, uh, so uh, I have, I am an RE uh, at Open Mind, and uh, Tushar and Ajinkya are two research scientists uh, who are working uh, on this project. And anybody who is interested, please um, join us. Uh, could use some help. Um, uh, so. Uh, I'm having a little bit of lag here with my slides. So our goals are that we want to understand uh, federated learning algorithms from an empirical point of view. Um, 
So uh, right now we are taking uh, baseline uh, FL algorithms uh, for our current phase. And our goal right now is to replicate these uh, baseline algorithms in PyTorch and uh, to understand their reproducibility uh, from uh, literature to code because um, a lot of these research papers uh, and authors haven't provided the code for their research. Um, so right now we are working mostly with MNIST, uh, but we plan to use leap data sets in future uh, for our implementations. Um, our idea is that we want to uh, compare these different uh, federated learning algorithms um, and uh, by firstly manipulating hyperparameters, uh, but later on we want to come up with a standard metric that uh, we can use uh, to define uh, the comparisons between different algorithms and how they improve over time. Um, so uh, we also um, are long fetch uh, goal is to try and push all of these federated learning algorithms and see is there a scenario where federated learning completely breaks and cannot be used. Uh, and uh, the main reason for us to do that is so we can provide a new research direction for um, people to, uh, for researchers to kind of look into those areas where federated learning is not possible currently. Um, over time, we plan to open source our entire code base of all these different algorithms to kind of create a standard uh, of uh, algorithms in PyTorch and uh, if time permits and if anybody who joins us is interested and we will be able to release this same code in Pycept as well, uh, which can be used in Pycept as a import. Um, and our, our main idea of all of this thing, all of the things that I've just spoken about is to kind of uh, create a code based survey paper, which to the best of our knowledge hasn't been written so far. Um, so what have we achieved so far? Um, there was a little bit of uh, issue with my pace of understanding FL um, as a topic. So things have been a little slow but we implemented federated averaging um, and we got some interesting results on federated uh, every averaging paper uh, where a uh, few to summarize right now are that the hyperparameters noted in the paper uh, did not work for us at all they got us stuck in uh, local minima and uh, we had some really interesting results where we were trying to replicate the architecture that they mentioned i'll talk more about this um, ahead um, and surprisingly, we were able to beat their target accuracy in fewer rounds with the hyperparameters that we chose to um, work with, um, which is pretty interesting to see. So, um, and we found that federated averaging is more powerful than they actually have mentioned in the paper uh, from our initial set of experiments. Um, on the other hand, uh, right now I was working with uh, implementing FedProx. Um, which uh, for which the code was provided on TensorFlow, but due to lack of documentation, it was very hard to follow. Um, although with FedProx, we noticed that uh, most of the results matched uh, as they claimed in the paper. So there is a very interesting trend here where things are kind of not matching at all. But for the most part, we are noticing that um, we can match the results, but it's not as easy as just going through the literature and taking their hyperparameters and then just making it work. Um, on uh, when we took a deep, deeper dive and tried to compare federated averaging and FedProx, uh, we did, did notice that FedProx does much better than federated averaging in uh, heterogeneous uh, systems, which is expected. But we also noticed that FedProx is much faster than federated averaging, and the special case where FedProx uh, perform uh, behaves like federated averaging. Uh, even in that scenario, we somehow notice that federated averaging, uh, Fed FedProx is doing a little bit better than federated averaging. So um, these results are still new. Uh, so we are going to uh, experiment with these results more. But from what we are seeing is that it's always better to use FedProx than even using Fed federated averaging at any point. Um, so uh, some of the results that we um, saw, and once this lag is gone, then I can actually explain. Um, 
is that uh, for federated averaging, so to, oh, okay, no, it's not, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so for federated averaging, uh, even though we were able to achieve their accuracy and lesser rounds, just to make it comparable with FedProx, um, I ran these experiments with 400 communication rounds. Um, the few interesting thing that we noted were the CNN architecture that I was talking about. Um, they said that they have a total of 1.6 million parameters in their CNN architecture. But when I replicated their architecture, I only got around 600,000 trainable parameters, which was interesting. Uh, also, uh, we did a, a few tweak, uh, tweaks in the model where uh, the authors were not using dropout and uh, using a single dropout after the second CNN layer uh, gave us better accuracy um, in federated averaging. And we noticed that uh, using dropout um, for MLP model, we can use a very high learning rate to improve accuracy as well, which is very interesting results. Um, um, and then these are some of the graphs that uh, we saw that on non IID data sets, we have a lot of noise, but it still converges uh, around the same time. Um, for FedProx, uh, the interesting thing was uh, that with 90% um, stragglers in FedProx, it's still able to match, nearly match the accuracy of federated averaging. Um, it's not like uh, it's it's like one or one point five percent below fed, federated averaging, but it's much faster because of the fact that um, the updates are happening much faster since um, clients are doing lesser epochs, uh, assuming that we have the virtual simulated uh, scenario right now where everything is happening in a single machine, but we are simulating virtual workers. Um, and the interesting thing was uh, we used the exact same hyperparameters from federated averaging into Fed, uh, FedProx and just added the hyperparameters required by FedProx and we still um, did better, but did approximately same as federated averaging in less time. Um, so that was a very interesting result. And I was not really expecting that uh, from what I read uh, in the paper. But I guess we, we're going to do some more uh, experimentation and see, is there a scenario where FedProx doesn't really work? Um, so um, what are we up to next? Uh, so we are going to further test whatever we have implemented and continue, come, uh, see, continue to see if we get the same results. And uh, now I'm working on a different paper, and we are going to continue to implement um, more baseline FL algorithms. Uh, that uh, that that might help us um, get a better understanding of how these algorithms compare through literature versus implementing them in code. Uh, and we also plan to develop a metric to standardize comparisons on different FL algorithms. And I guess we, we are hoping to get the answer to that once we have more algorithms implemented and once we have done more comparisons uh, between these algorithms. Um, so yeah, uh, that's about it. Uh, if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Fantastic work. That is some really, really great uh, baseline setting and great, um, um, yeah, I mean, really interesting and important findings as well to the extent that I think we're uh, a huge number of people on this call are also you know, leveraging you know one version of federated learning or another. Um, so even just the, just the notion that like, Apples to apples, Fed procs should be a drop in replacement. Um, it's really interesting. Also, um, I'll ask one question, and uh, anyone else who has questions, you're welcome to um, uh, drop them in the chat. Um, for um, when you were tuning this, um, what was it like to tune with uh, dropout? It, it strikes me that like model averaging is, you know, it, it's going to add a little bit of noise to training. But like, what was your, yeah, what was your experience in in, in doing that? Um. Actually, uh, I, I did not dive uh, too deep into it when I first was replicating their, uh, well, I used a very basic dropout pro probability of like dropping 2% um, of the nodes. Um, mm -hmm. 
and did not really have to, I did not really dive more into those because right when I did that, I was able to break their um, results mm -hmm. uh, in a few rounds. So I guess it'll be very interesting to see if, what happens if I actually change that and actually uh, add more dropout, uh, which I guess we're going to be, it's, I think it's a great idea and I think I'll be implementing that with this and try to test it. Man, it, it really strikes me that like so much about training and tuning is an art and not a science. Um, and work work like what you're doing right now is is going to be extremely useful to all of us just just to know what in general are our techniques that are working and not working when training these in the real world. Um, so yeah, please please do like be um, especially in your write ups and in your papers be extra verbose and like really talk about the different experiences, the different things that you try because I think all of that adds interesting color um, to just. How to, how, to, how to tune these things in the wild. Um, but great work. I think we've got to hop on to the next one real quick. Um, I'll check and see if there's any questions. But it um, uh, looks like uh, Anupam already got your slides pulled up. Thank you very much. Um, um, and yeah, I guess uh, over to you, Anupam. Please do introduce yourself. And uh, um, oh, I guess there's one drop in the chat from Tushar. They're actively recruiting for this federated learning project. I think uh, in particular, um, if you're, if you're uh, perhaps have a, a more engineering background and wanting to get into research, uh, implementing existing papers, setting baselines, because this kind of work is really, really nice uh, to, to, to get your, dip your foot in the water, and um, um, this team is a great team to work with. So yeah, definitely get in touch if you're interested in, in getting involved in research. Um, and yeah, now over to you, Anupam. Please introduce yourself, and then uh, the floor is yours. Anupam, you're muted, I think. Oh, yes. Can you hear me now? We can indeed. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so hi, I'm Anupam, and I am at the University of Edinburgh, uh, same as Tujar. I'm doing my PhD there. And um, today I'll be talking about uh, adversary utility in federated learning. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, Stages, uh, Somil, and me. So, uh, I guess everybody knows what federated learning is. That you know, it's primarily the the difference from the centralized machine learning is that the data is decentralized, compute is decentralized, and uh, the data can be uh, hit with increased non IV. Okay. So, you know that that's pretty much the advantages of federated learning that you know data is decentralized and compute. Uh, it gives you, you know, privacy by default, and now you can learn on, you know, um, you can learn on the heterogeneous data, right? But uh, the the thing is that the advantages also leads to vulnerability, right? Which are the backdoor attacks, which I'll be talking about. Um, so, what is a backdoor attack? Um, a backdoor attack uh, is an attack by an adversary such that the model behaves uh, as usual on the test data set on which the central server tests it. But on some of the other data set, which the adversary cares about, the data set, the model performs the way the, the adversary wants it to perform. But in this case, uh, the adversary wants that if somebody wears these brown glasses, then that person should be uh, classified as, you know, this person on the right, Allison. Okay. But if you wear some glasses, other glasses or no glasses, you get categorized correctly. And by injecting these kind of attacks, uh, you know, um, if you if you train such a, a system in a federated setting and if an adversary injects this kind of attack, then you know uh, that the person can get access to you know different things, even though he or she may not have authorization, right? Uh, so they were introduced back in 2017 in for centralized machine learning, but they're particularly relevant in the uh, federated learning. A uh, couple of more examples of uh, backdoor attacks, um, and 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 the typical uh, the intuition of backdoor attacks is uh, if there are you know n participating nodes and there are few adversary nodes, they want to put in the examples which other nodes don't have. For example, cars with you know racing stripe. Uh, cars with painted green, I mean, or, or some color, or, 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 or say a, a pink uh, Ferrari, okay, something which sort of other, uh, other nodes have a less probability to contain, okay. 
and then they can give it that the label that, that they want to so that you know a pink ferrari should get classified as a bird okay now so that's the intuition behind the backdoor attacks uh, similar attacks can be done for the language also uh, similar attacks can be done for the language also so you know if you i'm, I'm already 4 minutes down uh you, you, we're doing we're doing fine on time so Okay, so uh, so similar attacks you can do it on the language attacks. Uh, like you know, you 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 type in something, and the next word could be something which adversary wants to. Okay. Okay. So, uh, however, we have defenses. Okay, uh, the pro problem has been studied in last one or two years, and there are defenses. The first defense is you know. Uh, cram and multi cram, and this is uh, proposed in 2017. Uh, it works very well against these defenses, but it has its cost. The cost is that it assumes the data is homogeneous, and uh, what it means is that even the nodes which are actually honest but have a different data set, which is uh, which which the other nodes do not have, they also get categorized as uh, as adversary nodes or something. They get rejected in the overall scheme. Of it. Okay. Now it has an implication on fairness because uh, you know uh, it's like the same thing which uh, 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 in the first talk, uh, uh, first talk the poor gets poorer talk, right? So I mean you know the the, the somebody who has a lesser representation of data that gets categorized as an adversary. So it has that 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 sense to it. Right? The second defense is a norm defense a norm defense clipping, which what it does is it it uh, computes the norm of the gradients that the node has sent and compares it to the norm of the gradients or the other other nodes and if your norm is too different from other nodes then you get categorized as this so it works very well i mean it doesn't do this kind of unfairness but an adversary which knows what parameters are using to calculate the norm norm difference that can break it okay so it's not foolproof uh, we have a third defense which is called weak differential privacy uh, which again, you know, it goes back to what Fatima was saying: that poor gets poorer. Where you know, uh, if you if you if you increase that noise level, it of course affects the accuracy. But uh, the data set which is uh, un underrepresented, it gets affected far more than the normal data set. So, so all of these defenses come at their cost. My next slide is not working. Um, okay, so. What are the adversary's choices? The, uh, adversary can do, uh, you know, throw more nodes to improve the chances of success. Uh, but we have results to show that, you know, your 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 chance of success will increase with the you know increase of number of nodes, but it will not increase forever. It will flatten out. Okay? So you cannot just keep throwing more nodes and expect, you know, a, a higher success thing for an adversary. Okay? Uh, second is that you know you can poison more data. So I mean, right now, suppose uh, if I uh, I'm an adversary uh, node and I can poison, you know, 10 percent, 20 percent, 100 percent. So the more data you poison, you have a higher chance of success. But the con is that the higher you uh, do, the more norm difference you will create with other nodes. Okay. So the more, uh, so you 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 will get detected by by even a uh, rather benign defense, which is a norm difference, norm uh, norm difference, norm clipping defense. Okay. So. Okay. There's a third choice for the adversary, which is, you know, I can pick an optimal set of triggers. Uh, a trigger uh, in the language case is uh, is a phrase which somebody will type in, and the next word is what the adversary wants it to be. If you pick a very high probability trigger, which you know uh, people type in more frequently, then it means that other people, other nodes would also be have that phrase, which means that you know when it gets uh, you know average using the Fed average at the server. Your uh, your effect will not count much unless you control a lot of nodes. Okay, so your effect will not count much. But it actually begs this question: that is this really a backdoor attack? Because you know, backdoor attack by essential means that you want to actually poison the data which other people don't have. So you actually you know want to uh, uh, poison in, in towards a lower uh, probability spectrum. Uh, we know from some results that it has a higher chance of success, uh, but is it is it worth doing it like what uh, what is a big deal even if you sort of you know poison a pink ferrari into something but uh, if there if it, but in some if you're building a model for say you know um, diagnosis of medical diagnosis and you can create too many false positive then you can actually do a, a denial of service attack okay uh, 
Probably, probably so, good to be maybe 30 more seconds. Is that OK, Anupam? Sure. Uh, so what are the trade-offs here? Uh, so the trade-off for the central server is to have a stronger defense, but they have side effects, as we have shown. Um, second is that uh, the, the server can show, the central server can use a normal clipping, but you know, the, if adversary knows the bound, then adversary can break it. Uh, what our contribution is that you know adversary utility is not straightforward. It's rather a gameplay between the server and adversary. So depending on the parameter server chooses, the adversary can actually change its parameter to get a better utility. So it needs to be calibrated, and it's a dynamic thing. We are currently working on it uh, because of the reasons we have mentioned so far. Uh, another open problem is that how to select triggers, how to know, how to estimate the probability of triggers, because you don't know what the data other people, other nodes have. And for any questions or any collaborations, please reach out to me. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, great and important work. Um, uh, Anupam will be around afterwards for questions, and then we all go back into the gather. Uh, next up, we have Harsh, who's talking about a very exciting topic called Federated Neural Architecture Search. Uh, which I think is a rather uh, new field, quite interesting, and holds lots of promise. Um, Harsh, uh, you want to introduce yourself and then uh, uh, share your screen? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm Harsh. Uh, I am. I finished my master's uh, from Harvard and Georgia Tech in uh, neuroscience and computer science. Uh, I guess it's been three or four months now. Uh, since then, I've started work at Perspecta Labs as a research scientist, where I lead um, the autonomous adversarial defense team, which is like a really complicated topic. I lead a small team there. And then uh, also uh, work on some CV-related projects there. Um, other than that, yeah, I'm a research scientist here at OpenMind. I lead the uh, the privacy-preserving uh, neural architecture search team. Um, but we kind of have branched into a lot of topics, and we have a lot of great collaborations. So there's a lot of things happening, which I'm hoping to present today. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, let me present. Can you guys see the slides? You can indeed. Okay, I'll start my clock too so I don't go over. As a, as a reward for being late, you can go over a little bit. We're doing okay, all right, well, yeah, I'll try not to, but maybe it'll happen. <laughs> so, great, yeah, so um, let me just jump in. Uh, so, so first thing is, um, uh, here, here's the members of the group. Uh, so our, our core group started with Rosha and Amir, Atharva, Saheb, and myself. And Saheb actually presented um, a work that we were involved in, uh, which, like we said, got accepted at the ICML Health System Conference, the benchmarking um, different privacy on resonance for medical imagery. Um, so that was really exciting. And today I'm probably going to talk more about some other earlier stage projects. And we have a ton of collaborators. So we have a bunch of projects underway. Um, including some faculty at, at Harvard and Georgia Tech, uh, and then Ayush here from Open Mind, and then a bunch of great other researchers from a from bunch of awesome institutions. And we're working on a variety of, of different projects. So I, I thought I would, um, it's going to be a slightly different talk, so I, I'll sort of give a quick one-line overview of the different things we're doing, um, and then dive into uh, the big project, which is in this sort of privacy-preserving uh, neural architecture search space, um, and talk about what we're doing there. And it's uh, sort of still at an early stage, but uh, maybe I can explain our direction. So, um, but yeah, so so first of all, it's there's that uh, that project, which is where we're sort of studying privacy-preserving techniques, including differential privacy and federated learning on um, both multimodal learning, meta-learning, and then like specifically like architecture generation. Um, and there's like Andrew was saying earlier, it's this is a this is a pretty new-ish space. So so there there has been some really cool work recently. Um, but there's a lot of low-hanging fruit and a lot of useful contributions to be had here. So if you're interested in this kind of thing and or you're working on something related, please uh, hit us up um, and we'd love to work with you or in however, whatever capacity. Um, we're also working on like some other stuff. So uh, uh, we're working on sort of reverse engineering uh, learning principles from uh, from computer vision networks. So um, this is kind of like uh, parallels the work being done by the circuits group at OpenAI. Um, but we're looking specifically at sort of like different computational primitives. And then um, also, we hope to expand beyond computer vision to sort of other tasks, and eventually maybe multimodal tasks also. Um, and then on the other side of this, there we're also, uh, this is a really exciting project. We're working on sort of a, uh, a, a general approach to um, automating uh, the, the, the generation of, of very large multimodal networks that have you know really cool qualities like sparsity and 
different heterogeneous processing primitives. And um, so that's like a really like, there's a lot of non-trivial stuff there, but it's a really exciting project. And like the hope is, is that in, in sort of um, uh, building up like a general theoretical approach, we can maybe come up with useful implementation that can allow people to build way more complex networks way easier. Um, and then there's a lot of other applied projects that are underway too, um, relating to like CV, um, uh, intelligent user interfaces and things like that. But today, uh, definitely focusing on the privacy aspect. So, um, so uh, th th this sort of uh, the way we're focusing on this this kind of neural architecture search task is really actually building off the same sort of experimental structure that that uh, that Saheb I and team did uh, for the the benchmarking the ResNets uh, presentation that he gave. Um, uh, so first of all, I thought I'd try to catch everyone else up. So there was actually a really brilliant paper. So so around June we started exploring this space and we were. Um, kind of looking at different architecture search uh, algorithms and they brought like search these search methods broadly fall into sort of three different spaces there are uh, like uh, reinforcement learning based methods um, there are evolutionary based methods and then there's also differential methods where you can kind of um, treat the search space as continuous and, and optimize along it which is very computationally efficient um, and so we were looking at these and trying to figure out how we could formulate uh, this this architecture search problem in a federated setting because architecture search is actually seems like it would be very useful uh, in a federated setting where you have a bunch of different clients with sort of local data and you want to get them um, essentially like the best model for the tasks that you know whatever's being done at the at the edge so um, it's sort of tough for for sort of more traditional machine learning because uh, as researchers when we're designing sort of the optimal model for a space we need to know about that the, you know the data in that space what the sort of latent structure of information is like and you don't have access to that in uh, in a federated setting um, so architecture search allows you to kind of automate the design of those networks um, so right as we were kind of evaluating a bunch of different things uh, this awesome paper came out, so uh, which is uh, which kind of sucked because it was sort of a grab one of the low hanging fruit, but also is really good because they did a great job and it, it shows sort of the applicability of this. So um, this came out of a team at UCSD uh, where I have the archive link here, um, and uh, essentially what they do is they combine architecture search. Uh, they first develop architecture search in sort of a federated setting, and then they combine it with a, a basic sort of a DP process. So I'll sort of set that up for you guys and, and talk a bit through it and kind of some of the implications. So, um, so yeah, so at a high level, they propose this uh, DP FNAS. Now these uh, <laughs> these acronyms are getting longer and longer, but uh, uh, where they're essentially using a gradient-based architecture search, so continuous architecture search, to uh, to basically update client models. And then they also add, because it's a gradient sort of based search, you can add noise to it uh, in the sort of differential privacy um, framework. Uh, and uh, that's that's how they sort of, and then they, they have some theoretical analyses also. Um, and, and this is interesting because uh, Architecture search seems effective in the federated setting, but alone the federated setting doesn't really provide any privacy guarantees because of the sort of sharing of these um, uh, different sort of intermediate statistics, right? Uh, so um, applying applying gradient based DP seems like a seems like a useful sort of uh, extension to this kind of general setup. And what's really interesting is they achieve very good performance. So you can see on the right, like they're optimal generated networks. Um, based on you know different sort of configurations of, of number of workers and uh, the particular sort of federated versus DP federated setup, and you can see that the the sort of DP FNAS doesn't actually do that much worse than vanilla NAS working on one sort of centralized uh, computational uh, like box, right? Like a single GPU or um, locally, and uh, that that's pretty encouraging because these are sort of directly applicable ideas. Um, so, but there are um, a bunch of offshoot research directions that we are starting to evaluate now. So um, there's a couple things here. So they, they particularly chose uh, to use sort of a gradient-based uh, neural architecture search um, because, the, so uh, one, it's computation very efficient, but two, it's also convenient because DP sort of slots perfectly into that framework, uh, which, is, which is sort of useful for them. Um, but that opens the opportunity to try to evaluate how other, um, search systems, including random search, evolutionary search, uh, RL-based search, um, can sort of be fit into this framework. So that's kind of low-hanging fruit, um, and uh, but I think a useful contribution. And uh, and the other work which we're we're sort of heading off in that direction is um, is benchmarking the the performance of these uh, this sort of um, 
setup uh, in the same way that we did with the residual network. So we could compare uh, different statistics about the performance and also sort of a qualitative comparison of uh, generated networks, the topology and the different primitives they use. And there's a bunch of other exciting implications. I have already gone to seven minutes and like 45 seconds, so I don't want to take up too much more time. But um, but yeah, I, I'd be happy to talk about this. A uh, really exciting area, I think, in the long term is multimodal neural architecture search and then trying to figure out how uh, there's some, some non-trivial modifications that have to happen to make this setup work for multimodal stuff. And that's a pretty novel contribution. So we're looking at that too. Um, yeah, uh, so that's about it. If you want to talk more, you can hit me up on Slack. I'll, I'll try to be here for a few minutes after. Um, and then you can also just shoot me an email uh, at hirsch at manifoldcomputing.com. Excellent work. Very good. Um, we will go uh, straight to Fran. So again, um, please stick around afterwards in the gather if you want to have a chat with Harsh um, or, or ping him on Slack or via his email. Um, great, great work. Super promising. Um, over to Franz. Franz, please uh, introduce yourself. And he's going to be talking about federated online learning for time series data. Um, yeah, introduce yourself in your project. OK, hello, everybody. My name is Franz Pabst. I am a PhD student at the uh, Graz University of Technology, but I'm located at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna, both in Austria, this country. So I see my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, awesome. So, uh, okay, so. Uh, the topic of our project is called Federated Online Learning from Series Data. It's done by me, Tusha and Santiago. And yeah, the title pretty much says it all. What we are trying to do achieve with this project is we're trying to study a federated online learning for time series data. The motivation behind this being is that if you think of uh, 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 some devices that you have a device on the edge, it receives a lot of uh, continuous sensor data. And we want to use this, or we want to use a setting like this for federated learning. And we did this by uh, using a data set called uh, VSAT, which is a multimodal data set for variable stress and defection detection. It consists out of 15 subjects, and it's basically uh, you have a lot of, yeah, a, a lot of uh, data from a variable device, and then it's it's used to classify if the subject is uh, in a is stress on uh, is, is in a neutral state on a stressful state, or if the subject is in a, a neutral stressful or in a state of amusement. So about the purpose, our kind of creed is the constant dripping worth the stone. We're making slow but steady progress. What we did was selecting a data which actually turned out to be a little bit more challenging than I originally thought, because unfortunately there is nothing like MNIST for time series uh, data, especially not if you want to use it in a federated setting. But anyway, we managed to find one. We also managed to create a non-federated uh, machine learning or deep learning baseline for this one, where we, ch where we used uh, data which was, we, we used data from the data set which was recorded using a chest-based device. And then we used LDA and for the uh, STM on it. And you can see the performance with LDA is okay. The performance for the LSTM is actually quite good. So th that's what you already did. And now let's get into the, the current issues we're working on. We want to train this thing in a federated setting. And we also already explored strategies how to partition the data set and how to distribute it. We did it basically by making one worker for each subject in the test set. And yeah, we also did this with uh, imbalanced affected uh, state labels. We, we split, we also have a global test set where we split, uh, yeah, we, we used it all together and we did a 30% uh, random uh, holdout per class and per subject. Uh, now we are also in pro and process of uh, federating the LSTM models. We are uh, using PySift, which uh, works, but unfortunately not is good. It's, it's not in a production state yet, and we are still, we kind of have to do it. Uh, we have to also uh, fix a lot of things on our own in order to get it working the way we want to. As you can see, this is still kind of buggy. And yeah, the other thing is we have uh, some more like, like crazy, more advanced ideas we want to do this once we get the 
once you get it in a federated training, like for example, using a, a diffusion network for effective detection. And then or we will uh, soon, hopefully within the next month, we want to start doing experiments, uh, do, start doing experiments with online learning. So, and one thing we forgot during this, this month is that we're actually doing, we are dog fooding, meaning if you know the term, we are using PySift for our own experiments because I think it's very important since we open mind is developing these tools, I think it's very important that we not only preach them, but we also uh, practice using them. And so the more people use it, the better. We, Santiago, already found some bugs and reported them or worked around. And yeah, as you can see here in the picture, uh, Santiago is the puppy who really digs in. Tusha is like knowingly looking at him and I'm just a confused puppy. Okay. That's with my set. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you, you can see your second skill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franz, um, and super grateful uh, that you are helping to harden Pisip. Uh, so super, super grateful for that and for your work. Um, uh, if you could share your slides, that would be really helpful. I think um, uh, at least for a couple of us, it might have been stuck on the on the first slide, but um, it's just so we can see, see what was in, in, in the contest. That would be really great. Um, but yeah, really, really great work. Again, thank you for pushing through. Um, um, yeah, pushing through edge cases and and, and um, different architectures inside of Pisip and, and fixing bugs. I mean, that's uh, uh, doing doing the hard stuff to make it robust. So really, really appreciate that. Um, and finally, um, so we have uh, last but not least, we have one more presentation, and then after that, uh, Maddie Shang will also have a recruiting announcement for for recruiting from the new dev team. So do stick around for that. Um, but I'm um, uh, very grateful for, for Stephen to uh, want to take this slot. Um, Stephen, please do introduce yourself and uh, um, get started. Yeah, can everybody hear me okay? You're a little bit quiet. Can you be a little bit louder, maybe? Yeah, I can definitely project. No problem. So um, my group, we're doing uh, efficient encrypted ML. Um, I'm going to be speaking primarily. Uh, Vishal might chime in a little bit for some side comments. But yeah. Um, the general landscape so far is like to have better crypto for ML. And what our team's trying to do is make ML better for crypto. Um, so like some real motivation behind this is uh, privacy via encryption, um, opening up machine learning problems, uh, sensitive security sensitive problems, um, opening those up to machine learning. Uh, this is kind of non-obvious on its face. There are some problems like uh, like, uh, like Facebook's trying to remove certain kinds of images off of the platform, for instance, that might be uh, sensitive um, and have sensitive content that you don't want to expose uh, to leaky models and so um, addressing some of those kinds of issues. Um, we really want to know for sure, though, like one of our big research directions on the team is, uh, can we be encrypted by default? And if we can't, what's our upper limit on like how far we can push encryption as like as a tool for doing this? So um, if you weren't already aware, encrypted ML is rather slow. Um, homomorphic encryption is one of the main ways of doing encrypted ML at the moment. Um, uh, PIA is a means of doing that. It's, uh, it's kind of big. It's kind of heavy. Um, there's lots of costs involved in this. So we're kind of pursuing another route with Secure MPC. Uh, Secure MPC is uh, low compute cost, but high networking cost. And so we have this additional complexity involved of rounds of communication. Some people have already mentioned this with federated learning. Um, yes, I'll share this slide deck more if I want to get to some other stuff. Um, so like there's lots of prior work in this space. Um, we've got like crypto oriented neural architecture design. We've got uh, NAS S, we've got Delphi, we've got faster crypto nets, and we've got Falcon. Um, which is one thing that's really inspiring a lot of our research work here. Um, there's also been some other work done to accelerate HE, uh, homework encryption. Um, but, but for the most part, we're really focused on um, having better neural networks um, via um, improving the fundamentals. Um, so we've got like these big limitations here in the prior work. Uh, to highlight a few of those, um, we've got weak primitives and we're using kind of weak data sets. Uh, CFAR 10, CFAR 100 are like some of the better papers use that, but a lot of things are doing NAS on MNIST, and that doesn't really apply to many larger problems, as, a, as people have already covered. Um, the protocol, the security protocol that's being used to ensure that these, these data stay secure um, aren't often addressed, and we want to make sure that that's brought to the foreground. And once again, the, the primitives are kind of weak here. Um, not many lear learning algorithms are covered. Um, Crypto-related parameters aren't really addressed. Um, and like in NAS in its own way is like a big thing to take on. Um, so like, I'd love to talk more about all this stuff. Um, please reach out to me on Slack and gather. I'll be sharing my contact information later. Um, but yeah, the gist of it is that we want to make things faster. Um, Falcon is the fastest that we've seen so far in this space of like secure MPC-driven machine learning. 
Um, but even then there's like this round complexity uh, on like something as simple as a ReLU and uh, the derivative of a ReLU. Um, so um, yes, just the big, the big goal that we have here is to improve crypto-oriented architecture search, um, building up new primitives. Uh, so like, so what are some of these new primitives that we're talking about in specific? Um, we're talking about new layers. We're talking about sparse and quantized architectures, lower compute costs. Um, we're looking into benchmarking experimentation across uh, different scenarios. We're looking at uh, results from the literature, uh, finding out new methods that can really improve encryption sensitivity in the landscape, um, and scaling these methods to like actual impressive, more modern data sets like ImageNet. Um, we've currently done some uh, pretty decent work in approximation and layer modules. We currently have a, a code base that we're building out. Um, We've, uh, we're starting to lay the groundwork for some benchmarking suites that a lot like some other work that's been mentioned already, like benchmarking better at learning. We're benchmarking secure uh, ML in the secure MPC setting. Um, and we're also going to after reproducing some of the uh, results from current literature with our two bigger goals being to um, kind of get at these sparsified architectures and really getting at these modern data sets. Because again, like if we can only do encrypted ML on something like an MNIST problem, um, we're not really going to like make a dent in the market and actually get this into the hands of the problems um, and the problem solvers who need them. Uh, but, but really kind of be kept, kept at a small scale. And we don't want that. We want to actually make this bigger and more useful. Um, so right now we've got a tool called Speedies. Um, and yeah, 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 we're building out this library as a team. Um, we've got lots of work to do, but uh, yeah, there's, there's lots to do. We'd love to collaborate with lots of you guys. Um, you can reach me on Slack. Uh, Vishal helped a lot with this presentation. Um, and I'm in Gather right now. I'm like the little red dude in the corner. So <laughs> you can ask some questions. Um, that was a little bit rushed, but yeah, um, for sake of time, uh, that's everything. So please with the questions. Great work. That's awesome. And super, super important, super, super general purpose. Um, uh, encrypted computation holds a lot of promise. And you're right. Like all, all the problems you stated are, are super top of mind. I think actually, um, um, George earlier probably ran into some of those some of those problems when they were trying to deploy this in the medical domain. Um, so yeah, super super exciting. Um, so uh, maybe one one brief announcement before I pass it off to to Maddie for another announcement. Um, so you guys might have seen uh, we've announced um, Open Minds first privacy conference. So if you like the talks that you saw today and you're interested in seeing more talks that are like this, or perhaps submitting a talk uh, that you would like to give. Um, uh, I just dropped the link in the chat. Please do check it out. So it'll be at the end of at the end of September. Um, and um, uh, many of the research teams around here are indeed recruiting. Um, and also, the dev teams are also recruiting. And in particular, uh, one update is that the um, uh, Pygrid team and um, the web and mobile team are now sort of form grouping together to become a federated learning team. So if, if uh, you're interested in federated learning development, or I think one of these more interesting is getting connected and creating relationships between folks that are focusing primarily on the engineering and like getting, you know, PySIF to basically have all the features that you want, right? And um, and sort of the research topics, so like and learning new frontiers and being able to tune federated learning, be able to do lots of interesting architecture search and this kind of stuff, I think is, is really holds a lot of promise. Um, I would say that Kritika, who gave a presentation earlier today, has done a particularly good job of uh, building bridges between um, the difference of privacy engineering groups and the difference of privacy research group that, that she leads. And that seems to have been a really, really great thing for our organization. Um, and along those lines, uh, Maddie Shang, if Maddie is still around, has an announcement for a new team that she's starting that she'd like to recruit for. Uh, Maddie, are you around? I saw her join earlier, but she might be muted. I'm scrolling through the names. She's here. Yeah. Cool. Well, given that she's quiet, um, so Maddie is recruiting for a recommender um, systems team underneath the Federated Learning Team. So if you're interested in doing development for Federated Recommender Systems, I know there were several projects mentioned today. Oh, Maddie's got an audio issue. Hopefully she'll be here shortly. Um, but yeah, so um, a little bit of background. So you guys might be aware that the um, uh, PyTorch funded um, $250,000 to focus on uh, building out federated learning and encrypted computation in PySIF. The, the PyTorch fellows just finished their grant. Um, Maddie was was among them. Um, and as uh, an output of that grant, Maddie produced a demo for uh, that used SIFJS to have a website that learns 
to improve itself using federated learning, meaning like each time you load a web page, you interact with the web page, um, a model would, would come down, you'd interact with it, it's trying to accomplish some sort of goal, and the next time you load the web page, it would actually display a slightly different web page as it tries to learn um, and improve itself over time. It's pretty cool. So it's like federated reinforcement learning in the browser. It's a very impressive demo. Um, and sort of on the heels of the engineering work that's for that, she's um, interested in starting a team um, around that. So um, hopefully, uh, yeah, federated RL in a browser. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty incredible. Um, it was a really compelling demo uh, back to um, the PyTorch folks. Maddie, is your audio working now? Maybe not. All right, cool. Well, um, Maddie will also be um, uh, in the gather. Um, Actually, I'll just I'll drop the gather link again for those of you who don't have it. Um, I will uh, be hanging out uh, there probably for the next I don't know hour or so. It, at this point, it's pretty it's pretty casual. Um, but if you'd like to have a chat with anybody who was around here who's, who's still still around, um, really the goal is just for us to kind of get to know each other a little bit more in a way that we can't necessarily do um, in a in a meet style hangout. Um, but hopefully, Matt will be there. I think Harsh will be there. Um, maybe uh, and Alfredica. It's probably kind of late where you are, but also. And friends and Stephen and many of the, the talks you just saw. So um, thank you everyone for being here. I think this was a pretty big success. I know we had almost 100 people in here at one point or another. I think we'll probably keep doing this. Um, so if you're interested in um, uh, seeing the updates on how these research projects went a month from now, um, you know, join the Slack, stay tuned. We'll drop another invite um, uh, over Open Minds Twitter and in the Slack uh, when we announce next month's uh, presentations. So yeah, thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you together. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.